Our next presentation uh, is by uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Sheeman. Dr. Sheeman is the uh, Chief of Cardiothoracic Surgery at UCLA. And I must say, it's been, um, it's been a, a real pleasure to work with him in some of the more complex cases. Uh, we've developed a nice team approach, and I think uh, our patients are better for it. Um, Dr. Sheeman is going to present on endovascular aortic valve replacement, indications, and patient selection. Richard. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to talk today. Uh, obviously, when blood comes out of the heart into the aorta, it has to pass through the aortic valve. So a lot of people consider the aortic valve part of the heart, but it actually attaches to the aorta and is involved with many aortic pathologies. So working together in the, um, can I have that first slide up? Okay. Working together in the aortic center has really been a pleasure and it's given a phenomenal opportunity for the cardiac surgeon and the interventional uh, component of uh, vascular surgery to work together as a team as well as with the cardiology. I've extended my talk a little bit to talk about the state of the art of aortic stenosis in 2015. I sit on the scientific advisory board of Edwards Life Sciences that makes the premier um, uh, valve uh, that is given uh, so much play in the literature and been so successful in clinical practice known as the Sapien valve. I'll mention some devices that are really not FDA approved and I will let you know when we do that. So the bread and butter of interventional cardiology is this coronary lesion. And we know that interventional uh, procedures for coronary artery disease have really been the mainstay of what interventional cardiologists have done. And placing a stent has been very successful in subset of patients. Well, what has happened over time with uh, improved medical therapies, both medical, lifestyle, and the like, myocardial infarction has continued to go down. Uh, STEMIs have gone down. And the medical industrial complex that supports interventional cardiology has worked together with cardiologists to look at other areas of structural heart disease and see if devices can be um, improved. So I hope my cardiology colleagues don't mind this uh, thoughtful uh, pose of this, uh, of this monkey, but uh, the approaches to left atrial appendage, atrial septal defects, uh, ventricular septal defects, and primarily by valvular heart disease have been uh, really where a tremendous amount of intellectual property, investment, and focus has gone. So transfect catheter valve therapies have been successful in the aortic position, in the mitral position, and the pulmonic position. And there's a variety of uh, devices. And what I want to highlight today is the use of the um, uh, sapien valve and the core valve, which are the two devices have, that have been approved. The diagnosis of significant aortic stenosis is really quite straightforward. Echocardiogram is the mainstay. And these are the uh, appropriate indications from the ACC and AHA on guidelines. And you see to the far right that once the jet velocity through the valve is greater than four millimeters per second, uh, the mean gradient is over 40. The valve area, which normally is three to four square centimeters, is down to one square centimeter. And the valve area index is less than 0 0.6. We're dealing with critical aortic stenosis. So aortic stenosis is really an uh, age-related phenomenon. Many of you all learned in medical school, senile aortic stenosis is a term that's commonly used. I will not talk about bicuspid aortic valves today because they are currently contraindicated for a uh, percutaneous approach. If you actually look at the incidence of this disease, particularly as our population ages, 3% of people over the age of 75 suffer from aortic stenosis. So it is a major public health problem and is increasingly uh, being looked at as an area of growth um, in the cardiovascular arena. The pathophysiology, uh, as you have increasing outflow tract obstruction, a variety of things happen. 
Uh, you have increased uh, systolic pressure in the left ventricle in order to propel blood through the aortic valve. Uh, the ejection time lengthens. The diastolic pressure as the heart hypertrophies goes up, uh, giving symptoms of heart failure. Um, and eventually, the aortic pressure will drop. As the LV mass increases, you have LV dysfunction, increased myocardial consumption, and eventually heart failure. And therefore, the classic triad of these patients of developing intermittent uh, syncope, angina, and congestive heart failure is well understood from the physiology. This is a very lethal disease. It takes many years of onset, but once the patient becomes symptomatic at the inflection point of that curve, you can see if you have heart failure symptoms, you're likely to have 100% mortality within two years. If you have syncopal episodes, it's usually three years. And if you have angina, you can live out to five years. So this is a highly lethal disease where most patients presenting with symptoms will be dead within two to three years. If one looks at other uh, serious cancers, uh, severe inoperable aortic stenosis has higher mortalities than almost even lung cancer. If one looks at the natural history of aortic stenosis in the elderly in a uh, uh, age match population, you can see at one year, about 50% of the patients will die. This complex slide shows an algorithm of how you treat severe aortic stenosis. Um, and it really depends upon whether you're symptomatic or asymptomatic, whether you're undergoing heart surgery for coronary bypass or not. But as you can see on the bottom, it's a class one indication to have the replacement of your aortic valve if you're symptomatic, as I've already shown you, because, the, because of the lethality of the disease. If you're undergoing other types of heart surgery, say for coronary artery bypass surgery, when the symptoms are equivocal, stress testing is now done to determine whether or not the patient under certain stress conditions uh, will develop symptoms, and that is a pathway to surgery in many patients. And also, if you have a fall in your injection fraction, and that people, even if they're asymptomatic, if the EF is less than 50%, they're very high risk for mortality, and therefore, it's a uh, class one indication for surgery. Uh, on the right-hand side of this slide shows what happens if you have moderate aortic stenosis. And I won't spend time with this, but there's a subset of patients who do not develop very high gradients. Uh, their ventricles are actually have burned out, and now they have what's called low pressure, uh, low gradient aortic stenosis. Those patients are also at high risk and have a indication for operative intervention. So in symptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis, uh, aortic valve replacement is the gold standard and mainstay of therapy and not only improves symptoms, but also improves survival. If one looks at patients being operated on in the uh, curves at the top, whether you're symptomatic or asymptomatic, there's a marked improvement over patients with no symptoms who do not go undergo aortic valve replacement um, uh, and that's the dashed line in blue, and then the final solid line are symptomatic patients who do not undergo aortic valve replacement. But what happens to the elderly? Is age a contraindication? Uh, the oldest patient I've done in aortic valve replacement is 100 years old. Uh, in the PARTNER trial, which is the main trial I'll show you for transcatheter therapy for the aortic valve, the oldest patient was in the high 90s, uh, 98 years old. So the guidelines do not really incur age, and it's really a clinical judgment with factors both from the patient, the referring doctor, the internist, the geriatrician, that really determine whether the patient, in spite of the mortality rate of this disease, gets referred to a surgeon. Now, many studies have tried to look at what is the rate of underutilization, and a very interesting study that came out of Europe showed about one-third of elderly patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, clearly an indication for surgery, were denied surgery by their doctors in that they were felt to be too frail or too high risk. Dealing with elderly patients, we know that they often are concerned about their recovery, about stroke rates, um, about returning to their lifestyle and their independence, and they often perceive themselves as being too old to survive an aortic valve replacement through traditional approaches or even minimally invasive approaches. Therefore, transcatheter aortic valve replacement has risen to a very promising alternative therapy 
and opens the ability to replace the aortic valve in those patients who are either deemed to be inoperable or very high risk for conventional surgery. In April of 2002, Dr. Elaine Cribier in Paris uh, constructed a frame of uh, metal and put a tissue valve, actually a valve from pericardium from the horse, uh, an equine pericardial valve, uh, made it so that it could be collapsed and crimped on the end of a balloon and actually delivered it to the aortic valve in a patient through a transeptal approach, uh, therefore accessing the venous system, going across the atrial septum, through the mitral valve, up and around to the aortic valve position, and had a successful deployment of this valve. Nowadays, using current technology, and this is the Edwards Life Sciences uh, Sapien XT valve, uh, you can see there's phenomenally uh, ergonomic delivery devices that are 16 French. They have the ability to control the flexibility to go over the aortic arch. Uh, they can be delivered very accurately into the aortic valve position through the transfemoral approach in probably 90% of the uh, cases. The other competing uh, uh, company that has been FDA approved is the Medtronic core valve. You see it has a very different design. Uh, the frame is made out of nitinol. The upper part sits in the ascending aorta. Uh, the valve is also made out of pericardial tissue, as is the Edwards valve. Um, and it's the same pericardial tissue that's used in the standard valves that we implant surgically. Uh, there are the valve sizes, and you can see the sheets that we are able to uh, deploy are very, very small. And as we heard in the prior talks, uh, percutaneous femoral access with perclose devices are our standard of, uh, of approach. This uh, video shows that after gaining access, the wire is uh, placed up over the aortic arch uh, through the aortic valve with a bend in it to stabilize it in the left ventricle. Then the uh, 16 French sheet is placed in the abdominal aorta and the first Part of the procedure is actually to perform a balloon valvuloplasty of the aortic valve so you can get the device in place. The balloon valvuloplasty is performed. You see the heart is quivering because we pace it at 140 beats per minute so that the balloon would not sail out of the aortic position. And now with the uh, device being placed in the descending thoracic aorta, it's assembled in that place. You can see that the uh, balloon is retracted and in the proximal part, uh, the silver area is where the actual collapse um, device is. Then it's brought over the arch with the steering mechanism that allows a very nice bend. And then it's positioned and both by echo and fluoro, we determine exactly that it's in the correct position. And then the heart again is rapidly paced. The balloon is expanded. The valve is in position. Uh, and it's the strong radial forces that keeps the valve from migrating. At this point in time, we do an assessment to make sure there's no peridotal leak and that all the three leaflets are moving normally, and that's primarily done with intraoperative transesophageal echo. And you can see you have a beautifully functioning aortic valve. In size for size, these valves actually have better hemodynamics than the valves that we put in surgically. So here's a real case. You can see the heart is about to be rapidly paced. We do a aortic root injection to be sure we have the true annulus. The balloon is in inflated. The valve is deployed. The balloon is brought down. And now the heart resumes a normal rhythm after the pacer is shut off. We also have to be sure that the height of the valve and the height of the takeoff of the coronary arteries do not get obstructed. Um, when we deploy these valves. So this is the, um, the core valve, which is a very, very different design. It's made out of nitinol. Uh, maybe this movie will not play. But the um, interesting thing about this particular valve is that it is able to be released and recaptured if you need to reposition it. Um, it has other uh, aspects, and I will show you some of the data. So the cath lab, or the hybrid room, gets very, very crowded. Um, you can see that there's two heart surgeons, two interventional cardiologists, you know, the echo attending, the fellow, anesthesia, the cath lab people, 
Uh, we have a pump there, a perfusionist, and the like. So 20 people are actually in the room to support these procedures. Uh, this year, we um, have actually simplified this in that we're doing the majority of these transfemoral cases with the new technologies uh, with conscious sedation. So there's no anesthesiologist, there's no pump, there's still the two cardiac surgeons and two interventional cardiologists who work as a team. Everyone is doing something as a part of the procedure. It was very important that, you know, the initial trials that went to put this technology together was called the partner trial. I'll show you some of the data because it implied there's a partnership between the interventional cardiologist and the cardiac surgeon. As a matter of fact, the payment determination that came out of CMS actually requires the surgeon to be part of the team and share 50-50 in the payment. And therefore, it has totally changed the dynamics of surgeon versus cardiologist in doing these procedures so that we can all be honest and give our patients the best procedure. So this is the design of the partner trial, a little complicated. On the right-hand side were the inoperable patients. The surgeon said this patient is not a candidate for surgery. So those patients were randomized versus standard therapy, which is usually just getting a balloon valvuloplasty, which is really inadequate therapy because within three to six months, the valve scars down again, versus getting a TAVR, which is the uh, percutaneous valve. On the uh, other side of the slide, 700 patients were randomized. Uh, some patients, because of the early technology, did not have the ability to have transfemoral access, and therefore, the valve was deployed through an apical puncture of the left ventricle. Um, and there was one-to-one -one randomization between the TAVR procedure and surgical AVR. And then the majority of patients did have a transfemoral approach. And again, there was randomization. Briefly, the results of the study showed that in the high-risk group, what was called non-operable group, who got balloon valvuloplasty, standard of therapy, versus the Edwards early generation sapien valve, you can see there was a major improvement in uh, mortality extending out to two years. This led to the uh, initial approval of the valve for the inoperable patient. If you look at that group of patients, um, and you can see in the blue, light, and dark, most of those patients were in class three to four heart failure. And if you look at 30 days, one year, and two year, the other sets of bars, you can see there, there was a marked improvement in heart failure for those that got a percutaneous valve versus standard of therapy. Going back to design for the other large part of the trial, the 700 patients, you can see for all cause mortality, whether you got a TAVR or a surgical AVR, Maybe this means the surgery was so good, but there was really no difference out to 36 months uh, between the two groups, and therefore the valve was approved for high-risk patients. High-risk being defined as an STS score of greater than 8%. Again, whether you got a surgical AVR or you got a TAVR, you had almost equivalence and relief of symptoms of heart failure. If one looks at stroke, there was a slightly higher risk of stroke with the uh, TAVR valve, and the older technology did not go over the aortic arch very cleanly and probably embolized several patients uh, due to that particular problem, and therefore there was a slight advantage for less stroke with the surgical procedure. Um, residual uh, regurgitation, usually perivalvular around the valve because the valve did not seal around the calcification was found to be a risk factor for early mortality. And therefore, if you actually take the patients that did not have any aortic valve of regurgitation around the TAVR valve, there was a marked improvement in mortality over the surgical group in the early stage. The core valve trial uh, essentially showed the same thing, but actually the core valve actually showed better results uh, than surgery at all time points, both for mortality, stroke, and these are looking at echocardiographic findings showing that there was lower uh, gradients across the valve than a surgical valve, and there was um, uh, better aortic valve areas at all time points. However, the perivalvar leak problem was a significant problem uh, for the core valve, and about 30% of the patients had some degree of perivalvar leak. There was a trial that actually put the two valves head to head called the CHOICE trial. You see the balloon expandable trial as the Sapien valve versus the uh, 
uh, core valve, which was a self-expandable uh, TAVR valve. Um, and highlighted in blue in the, in the bottom, you saw the incorrect positioning of the valve was a bit higher in the uh, self-expandable valve. Um, the uh, perivalvar regurgitation was higher. Uh, there was a higher risk of rehospitalization. Uh, the New York Heart Association class improvement was better with the sapien valve. Quality of life score was better. And new permanent pacemaker has been a major problem for the core valve because it sits into the LV outflow tract so deeply that 37% of those patients actually require a pacemaker where in less than 20% uh, for the balloon expandable valve. The new technologies that have not been FDA approved, they're out there. There's a tremendous amount of uh, creativity in looking at different designs, and you can see some of them displayed here. The current generation of FDA approved valve uh, for the Sapien valve is the one I'm showing you here, which has a slightly different stent design. But on the bottom, you can see that there's an actual fabric skirt, and this has markedly reduced that perivalvar leak problem that leads to uh, uh, continued mortality uh, in patients who have that, um, they get a transcatheter valve. Um, this slide actually shows, if, as you go across from left to right, the different generations of valve. This is looking at all-cause mortality at 30 days. And you can see from the very first generation valves in the uh, TAVR trial, you know, the mortality rate was 5 or 6%. Using the current generation uh, uh, Sapien 3, it's down to 1%. So improvements in technology have reduced mortality. You can see the same thing has happened with stroke rates, down to 6.5% to 2.6%. Is probably because of the improved steerability of the valve as it goes over the top of the aortic arch. Uh, perivalvar leaks have also been reduced by using that fabric skirt that goes around the bottom of the valve. Um, so obviously, people are now looking at lower risk patients. Uh, the SCS scores of 4 to 8 percent, and there's two new trials uh, looking at that group of patients. So our current practice in TAVR valves are these very elderly patients. All these patients are 85 years old, the good, the bad, and quote, unquote, the ugly. Um, obviously, the patient at the bottom, we did a TAVR valve on successfully. The patient at the top did extremely well with the TAVR valve. She's actually an aerobics instructor. Um, but she had had prior seven bypasses uh, years ago, and we felt that a reentry was high risk for her. The patient in the middle uh, is got severe advanced dementia in a nursing home with dying aortic stenosis. There is a cohort of patients that we probably should not offer this type of therapy. These valves are $35,000. They're very, very expensive. And that's one of the more difficult decisions that we have to make. Obviously, the calcified aorta makes many patients inoperable. Um, there's other high-risk groups um, that are very, very amenable to this. How do we calculate the STS score? It's a uh, score that's very easily uh, seen and able to be used online that for every single patient you put in risk factors and it tells them the risk of operative therapy. I won't go through a lot uh, because of uh, time as far as how we work up the patients, but the bottom line is, is really sizing the patients and we use CT scanning in order to size the aortic annulus to determine the size of the valve. We have the same access issues that have been discussed before because the sheath is quite large when we put it in the descending aorta. The go-to uh, alternative approach is a transapical approach. Um, and this is just a very quick patient. And you can see this patient, the left ventricle is very dilated, poorly contracting. It has a very, very high end diastolic volume. Uh, and also has central mitral valve regurgitation, you can see on color flow Doppler, and also has aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. We go ahead and deploy the TAVR valve, and immediately in the cath lab, the heart size came down, the volume is down to 168 from 250 before, the mitral regurgitation is gone, and we wrote this case up as killing two birds with one stone. Um, this is a case where we're concerned about the coronary arteries, and you can actually see a guide wire in the left main so that we can be sure if there is a problem with obstructing the left main, you can see how closely that stent comes to the left main coronary artery. We can stent the artery and salvage this patient. 
You can see this patient also has that dark ring underneath the valve. That's a St. Jude mitral valve. So this patient already had a prior valve replacement. Uh, this patient actually developed a small fistula due to the rigidity of the two valves together. And I think you can maybe see that amplaster, de amplaster device that was used to close this. So this is really a phenomenal case of interventional cardiology. Finally, I just want to show a case of why we're using more and more tissue valves in younger patients. Uh, you can see this patient has a tissue valve in the mitral position and also one in the aortic position. There's an algorithm that we can go knowing the type of valve and knowing the actual size and diameters. And we can do what's called a valve and valve procedure. And in this particular case, because of failure and restenosis of the aortic uh, bioprosthetic valve, we can actually deploy a valve within a valve so patients do not have to have a second procedure. So I actually have 40 and 50 year olds banking on valve and valve procedures in order to be able to not have to take Coumadin and have mechanical valves when they're younger. So all the uh, classifications are improving. So the interventional cardiologist and the cardiac surgeon, whether you're sled dogs or your dogs and cats, uh, used to have a little bit of an argument on the uh, appropriateness of which procedure was best, particularly in the interventional cardiology era. Here we are kind of singing the same tune, <laughs> happy campers uh, working together as a team. And this is the UCLA culture. Teamwork is the key in order to get the best outcomes and results for our patients. And this is a group of all the people that work together on the heart valve high-risk team every day at UCLA. Thank you very much for your attention.